two. Uh, we're continuing on in this lecture with our opening discussion of thinking like an economist. You'll recall in our first lecture that we opened up by defining what economics is, and we talked about issues like micro and macro and positive normative, that kind of trade-off between equity and efficiency. Uh, from there, we talked about scarcity, and the idea of scarcity started a cascade of different ideas, these key tenets of economic thinking. We know that scarcity requires rationing and competition. We know that scarcity requires decisions and trade-offs. Choices. Economics is the study of those choices. We then learned that the way that people make those choices in economic theory is in the pursuit of rational self interest, utility for individuals, profit for firms, and that incentives, those factors that can make utility and profits either easier to get or harder to get, those factors that can make life better or worse, those things that can reward us or punish us, that incentives play a key role in economic behavior. Okay, I want to now jump into the next idea. Um, we left off right here with the idea of car safety features and my crazy idea for reducing car crashes, but I want to now jump into the idea of Marginal thinking. Another key tenant, another critical, critical way that economists see the world is through the lens of marginal analysis. Marginal analysis, let's first define it. Marginal analysis is the process of comparing the additional benefits of an action with the additional costs. Now we know it's pretty common sense that you're gonna do a cost benefit analysis when you make a decision. You know, is it worth it or not? What's the pros, what's the cons? But you need to understand that in economics, it's not just cost and benefit by itself, it's the idea of marginal analysis, marginal thinking. When you think about the term marginal, you should be thinking about the idea of additional or next, or how about incremental. There are some decisions, no, I'm sorry, there are some decisions in life that are straight yes or no, binary, right? Do it or don't do it, yes or no. But most economic decisions are not yes or no decisions. They are how much decisions. You know that you have to study to get a decent grade this semester. So the question is not do I study or do I not study? The question is how much do I study? If you've already put in three hours in economics, should you put in an additional, marginal, incremental, we'll say, extra hour? That is economic marginal thinking. Okay, so it's really important that you understand that in economics, we believe in making decisions on the margin. You hear that term a lot, on the margin. What that means is you've already done something. You've already done a little bit of something. Marginal analysis says, should you do a little more? You know, you've already studied three hours. Should you study a fourth? You've already slept 14 hours. Should you sleep for a 15th? You know, you run a company one day. You've hired 12 workers. Should you hire a 13th worker? You know, Next Thursday, you go out to, you know, college bar night. You've had 19 Jaeger shots. Should you have a 20th? The decisions in economics are not about all or nothing. Good economic thinking is marginal thinking. But within that, the real chore, the real challenge is to correctly identify both those marginal benefits and those marginal costs so you can make a good decision. We call that decision matrix the cost-benefit principle. And the cost-benefit principle tells us in economics that you should take an action. How about this? You should take an economic action if and only if the marginal benefit from taking the action is at least as great are at least as great as the marginal cost. 
So it's not just that economics is cost benefit analysis. It is, but to be really precise, economics is marginal benefit, marginal cost analysis. Or any decision, should I do more of this or less of this? Should I hire that or not hire that? Should I you know, work an extra hour or not? All those decisions in economics are marginal decisions. And in economics, we are only concerned when we make decisions with the marginal decision. Anything that's already happened, anything that we've already done, we call in economics a sunk cost. A sunk cost is not recoverable. You've made it. You've taken on the opportunity cost. It's in the past. And in economics, when it's in the past, you leave it in the past. Economic decisions are marginal decisions. We make them if marginal benefits exceed marginal costs. Let's do a simple example real quick. Go through this with me. If you want, after I read it, you can pause it. You can try to work it out and then continue the video. We'll go through the answer. NASA, they estimate that the space shuttle program will generate gains of $24 billion per year. Okay. That's an average gain of $6 billion per launch. Okay. In economics, just so you know, the average is simply calculated as the total divided by the number of times. So if the space shuttle program generates $24 billion of you know, revenue or benefit, um, and that's an average gain of six billion, then we can probably safely say that we're talking here about four launches because 24 divided by six is gonna be four. Now, its costs are currently 20 billion per year. So the average cost, we'll call that the average total cost, would be the 20 billion in total cost divided by the four launches, which is gonna be five billion per launch. So far, so good. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, there we go. We're making $24 billion. We're only spending $20 billion. More launches. You might even say, look at the averages. The average gain is six and the average cost is five. Do more. But that is not necessarily the case because economic decisions are not based on total values and they're not based on average values. Instead, they're based on marginal values. Let's continue. Assume that the benefit of a fifth launch would be the same as the average benefit thus far, so six billion. So in other words, what we're saying here is if we did a fifth launch, that would generate an additional five billion of benefit. Question that I ask you, should NASA launch a fifth mission? Now, people who don't know economics would say, of course they should. Because they've already got $24 billion in gain. They've only spent $20 billion in cost. It's a win. Let's do more. Or they might say, of course they could, because the average is only uh, $5 billion in gain compared to, you know, sorry, I made a mistake. Pardon me. The average gain, the fifth launch would give us $6 billion. My apologies. My apologies. This, uh, sorry, the fifth launch would give us $6 billion. So a couple seconds ago, forget that. My apologies. If they do a fifth launch, it will generate six billion of gain. So let's go back to our analysis. Some people would say, of course they should do it because again, you're averaging six billion. That's your gain coming in. You're averaging five billion going out. Do it. But not so fast, econ friends, because to answer this question, we're not going to look at average cost. We're going to calculate marginal cost. And marginal cost is de uh, defined as the change in total cost by the change in the number. Marginal is a change function. Marginal cost is how much additional cost you take on when you do something more. In this case, what's the marginal cost of NASA's next launch? Let's do it together. The first, there's zero launches, so there's zero marginal cost. If there's zero launches, there's zero cost, easy. If we do a first launch, the total cost goes to three. So the marginal cost is gonna be the change in total cost, that's going from zero to three, that's three, divided by the change in number, zero to one. So three divided by one, the marginal cost there will be 
3 billion. Now let's take a look. If we do a second launch, our total costs go from three to seven billion. Now let's think about this. If one launch cost us three billion and two launches cost us seven billion, what is the marginal cost of the second launch? It's gonna be seven minus three divided by two minus one. That's gonna be four billion. If we do a third launch, you can see that two launches cost us seven billion total. The third launch takes our cost to 12 billion, so that third launch will actually had a marginal cost of five billion. The fourth launch, which NASA did, took our total cost to 20 billion. Now let's think critically here. If three launches cost 12, and doing the fourth one took your cost to 20, then that fourth launch actually had a marginal cost of $8 billion. NASA now is asking the question, should we do a fifth launch? I think you see where the answer is going. Let's figure it out. A fifth launch will take our total cost from $20 billion to $32 billion. If four launches cost $20 billion and a fifth launch took it to $32 billion, then you can calculate that the marginal cost of the fifth launch is $12 billion. So I take us back to our question, my friends, should NASA launch a fifth mission? The answer is clearly no, because the marginal benefit, six billion, falls far short of the marginal cost, 12 billion. In fact, we can ask a different question, Given this data, how many missions should NASA have launched? Well, here's what we would do. Let's assume that the marginal benefit of each launch was $6 billion consistently. The decision goes like this. For your first launch, marginal benefit was $6 billion, marginal cost is $3 billion. The benefit outweighs the cost, you do it. For the second launch, marginal cost is $4 billion, marginal benefit $6 the benefits outweigh the cost, you launch the second one. You can also see that NASA would have launched the third one because the marginal benefit of six billion for that launch would exceed the five billion. Notice that NASA should not have launched their fourth mission because even though it worked out in totals and averages, economic decision-making is marginal decision-making. If you take a look here, the fourth launch had a marginal cost of $8 billion. The marginal benefit was only 6 so in this case, the marginal cost exceeded the marginal benefit, and that's a no-no. And clearly, they should not launch a fifth one either. So if NASA was being run by economists and not like astronauts, they would have actually gone with the first three launches, but never done the fourth, okay? Final question for this little analysis. Suppose that the marginal benefit of each launch was six billion. No, so I was not six billion, but was rather nine billion. So suppose they recalculated and said, we made a mistake. We actually get a lot more benefit from these launches than we thought. We have marginal benefits of nine billion per launch. How many launches should NASA do? And you know, once again, it's a very simple comparison. Marginal benefit versus marginal cost. 9 billion is greater than 3 billion, do it. 9 billion greater than 4 billion, do it. 9 billion greater than 5 billion, do it. 9 billion greater than 8 billion, do it. 9 billion less than 12 billion, don't do it. So in this case, if NASA had recalibrated, recalculated that their marginal benefit was 9 billion, they should have done four launches. Okay. This is a, it's, a, it's not always intuitive, but it's a powerful way of thinking in economics. And if you want to succeed as an economic thinker, you have to always think about marginal analysis. It helps us also solve some weird riddles in economics, like this one. Perhaps you've noticed, if you drive up to an ATM machine, that the drive-up ATM has the braille buttons on the keypad and on the machine, okay? Comedians for years 
as well as smart asses for years, have asked the question with a little snark, why do they have these braille buttons on a drive-up ATM? Can blind people drive? Well, clearly it's, the answer is no, they can't drive, but it leads to an economic mystery. Why are there keyboard buttons on a drive-up ATM? To understand that answer, you always have to think back to economic principles. In this case, the marginal cost. Imagine that you are a manufacturer of ATM machines. You build them. You're an entrepreneur. You take scarce land and labor and capital resources and you combine them into ATM machines that you sell to banks, right? You're doing it to make profit. There you go. Basic economics. Think about how much money you have to spend to make each machine. There's a very good chance that once you've got the machine set up, including all your die presses to get your plastic and your buttons right, it would not cost very much to add the Braille buttons. In other words, the marginal cost of making Braille button ATMs as well as non-Braille ATMs would be staggeringly high because you'd be doubling up your production. These manufacturers realized early on that the marginal cost of adding Braille buttons to any ATM is very low. And as the marginal benefit principle tells us, as the incentive principle tells us, when the marginal cost is low, more than likely people will do it. So the, the, uh, the economic mystery of why there are uh, keyboard buttons on ATMs, it's basically tied to the idea of marginal analysis. ATM manufacturers realize that it doesn't cost a whole lot more to add buttons to an existing process, so they do it. It would be way, way more expensive to have two different production lines, one for Braille dot ones and one for non. They play by the marginal cost, marginal benefit rules, and that's why there's Braille dots on a drive of ATM. Okay? Final thing I want to point out when it comes to the marginal benefit, marginal cost rule is this. We believe in economics that over time, marginal benefits fall while marginal costs rise. This is critical to understand. We'll get into the reasons for this when we do a, a, a live uh, lecture and we can get some questions, some examples. But for now, I need you to grab the principle that marginal benefits fall over time and marginal costs rise. And this has some stunning implications on how much of something you should do. Let's first graph this. Start off with a simple diagram. Economics is all about diagrams. And up here, we're gonna label this axis cost and benefit, and we're gonna label this axis time. Obviously, we're starting right here at zero. So as we go out this way, our time increases. And as we go up this way, our costs and benefits increase, okay? So pretty straightforward. If we graph these out, if marginal benefits fall over time, we would draw the marginal benefit curve downward because as time goes on, the benefits fall. So marginal benefit curves slope downward. And since marginal cost curves rise, we would draw the marginal cost curve upward sloping. Again, a rising curve implies that as time goes on, marginal costs rise. Okay? So we have downward sloping marginal benefit curves, upward sloping marginal cost curves. Here's a very important rule. You achieve economic efficiency when you produce at the point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. I'll repeat that. You achieve economic efficiency when you produce at the point, the optimal production level, in other words, is at the point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost, which would be right here. We put a circle here to show the intersection of marginal cost and marginal benefit. I'm going to drop a dotted line down. I'm going to call this Q1 for quantity one. Quantity one is the optimal quantity. To prove this, let's take a look at a couple of other quantities. Let's say that you decide to produce here at Q2, quantity two. Let's do a dotted line upward. 
at Q2, you can see that the marginal benefit is up here and the marginal cost is down here. Some people would say, if they haven't thought about economic thinking, we should produce Q2. Q2 is better than Q1. And you would say, well, why is that? And they would say, well, look, at Q2, the gap between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost is bigger than it is here. While that might be intuitive, that's incorrect, because here's the point. The marginal benefit, marginal cost rule said you always produce when the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. And if you were to stop your production at Q2, this entire region right here would be potential gain that you would give up and lose on. Take a look. Let's do this, let's get rid of this. If you're at Q2, this entire region right here, between Q2 and Q1, the marginal benefits are greater than the marginal cost, greater than the marginal cost. If you were to stop your production at Q2, that's not, a, it's not bad, but it's not optimal because there are more transactions that you could have taken where you could have gotten more marginal benefit than marginal cost. This entire area, if you stop at Q2, would be potential gain that you left on the table. That would be called in economics, a dead weight loss, okay? So we know that Q2, while it's good, is not optimal. It could be better, and it would be better by continuing to make more transactions and take more activity as long as the marginal benefit exceeded the marginal cost. Now, clearly, let's say we had Q3. This one is very simple. We do a line straight up, and clearly Q3 is bad because at Q3, the marginal cost of the action is way up here and the marginal benefit of the action is way down here. So we know for sure that any points beyond Q1 are bad because the costs exceed the benefit. But it's important that you understand that any points to the left of Q1 are also bad because you're not extracting the full economic surplus, the full value, okay? So we're gonna wind up right here with this conclusion. We believe that marginal benefits fall over time while marginal costs rise. Therefore, the optimal amount of any activity is the activity at the level where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. If you've taken economics before, this graph right here should look very, very familiar to you. In fact, if you took out the marginal cost and called that supply and took out marginal benefit and called that demand, you would have a market at equilibrium. And if you've had any economics before, you know that equilibrium is a very happy point in economics. It's happy point for many reasons. One of the biggest reasons is when you are at equilibrium, you are at the optimal output at which all potential trades where the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost are intact. All right. That's a lot for now. So I want you to be thinking about marginal analysis, marginal thinking. Great job for staying with me. Um, remember, good economics is about not just principles, but it's about applying principles to the real world. So go through these notes. Ask yourself, what decisions do you make on a day-to-day -day basis? Are you making them through the lens of economic marginal thinking? Okay, next time we meet, we'll wrap up the key tenets of economic thinking. And then we'll have a final lecture for this module on some pitfalls to bat or some pitfalls to good economic things, some mistakes that people make, and that'll wrap up our first module. Okay, so we got two down, we got two to go. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you next time.